Well, good morning, church. Hopefully everyone's having a wonderful morning today. A little bit on the uh, foggy side out this morning, but you know what's really beautiful about it is you got to look at all the trees and bushes and everything, and they're just covered with that light covering of frost out there, and it just sparkles and brings a newness to the morning. So we welcome you here this morning, whether you're here in person or online this morning, to Grace Street Church. And uh, we always have a place for you here uh, in our midst and, and to bring the awesome Word of God to you. And I just want to go through a couple of things. We have uh, obviously a great start to a new year this year and uh, a fresh beginning. And we talked about that last week in our services. And it's an awesome thing. And you know, the thing about it is, is our, our choices make up where we're going to be and what's going to happen to us. And, and you know, I, I posted this week that we need to really choose wisely. And so we want to make sure that you're making great choices this year and that we're going to have a very, very positive year as well. And next weekend, this Saturday coming up, we're going to have movie night again here and a truly awesome movie uh, called Do You Believe? And uh, so we're going to have all the, the fantastic fair, the brownie bites. I got to mention those because I, I think I forgot to do it last time. And we'll, we'll have the hot dogs and popcorn and and drinks and everything available and just a great time with a great movie and uh, we hope you all can make it here and, and uh, uh, enjoy a truly truly wonderful time together here and a great movie besides uh, we got uh, some fun things coming up in our future here we're going to start the bible study up again this wednesday and so we're going to continue on with uh, you Are Never Alone by Max Lucado, and we're doing that study, and we've got some great studies ahead as Pastor Terry and I were kind of planning some things out earlier this fall, and uh, we've got uh, some things on the horizon that we're looking at as well, uh, possibly starting up another Financial Peace University and uh, doing a, a project called The Truth Project, which is an awesome, awesome study. Uh, we can't wait to do those kind of things. So we got a lot of great things coming towards us in 2021 fresh start to a new year and we're just happy to be here so let's go right in this morning and, and take a look at our call to worship and our call to worship this morning comes from deuteronomy 8 1 and 2 and in this it tells us all about the things in the writings of moses and it says be careful to obey all the commands that i'm giving you today then you will live and multiply and you will enter in and occupy the land the Lord swore to give you and your ancestors. Remember how the Lord God led you through the wilderness for 40 years, humbling you and testing you to prove your character and to find out whether or not you would obey his commands. And so when we take a look at this, it's kind of an awesome passage to think about it in. As we think about the book of Deuteronomy, Moses, when he wrote that, it really represents, the entire book represents a series of sermons that he was giving the people of Israel at the time to show that how God had remained faithful to that covenant that he had made with the people of Israel and proving out his promises to the people. And we have to ask ourselves, you know, at that point in time, now who is this proving for? Is it proving out for the people or is it proving out for God? Verse 2 says, Remember how the Lord your God led you through the wilderness for these 40 years, humbling you and testing you to prove your character and to find out whether or not you would obey his commands. So these passages and these sermons were not to prove out to God, but he knew from the very beginning what was going on. So we didn't need to prove these things out to God, but to prove it out to the people of Israel that God was still there amongst them each and every day. And he was proving out that covenant promise that he made to the people. And see, the thing about it is we have to understand from God's perspective, he already knows all, everything there is to know about us. And he's already there ahead of time. He's already in the future. And we're just a little blip on the radar, if you will. But God already knows what he has planned out for each and every one of us. So what these words are that he's giving to us is proving out 
that yes, he is faithful to his promises to us, his people. Sometimes we think we're stronger than we really are and God puts us through tests to depend on, see if we are, how weak we are and if we are going to lean on him and, 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 and try and lean on his strength and his character or whether we're gonna try and do it all ourselves. And that's what uh, they were saying in here is uh, to find out whether or not you would obey his commands. And so God puts us through these tests to see if you have confidence in our flesh that no matter what the circumstance is in, we would continue to lean on God himself and not on our own understanding. So God's purpose was to humble these people and to prove to them whether or not they would keep his commandments throughout those 40 years of wandering through the wilderness. And all the time he was providing for them along the way. He needed those people to understand that those provisions were coming from him and to lean on him and to trust in him as he proved out those promises to the people. And oftentimes we find ourselves needing proof that God is being right there with us as we go through all of our trials. But in reality, what we need to do is prove to God that we are with him. And that's truly the most important thing is we need to prove to God that we are with him because he's always with us. Let us pray. Great is your faithfulness, O God, our Father. You are faithful to your word. You are faithful to your people. And if we walk in your path of righteousness, we will know the blessings that you have for us, Father God. Your blessings will surround us and encompass us like the air that we breathe. And we pray today, Lord, that we would walk with you and follow you and commit our lives fully and totally to obey your will, to be pleasing unto you, O God. And I pray that that would be our commitment this week, to open our hearts and minds to you and accept your word into our hearts today and every day. And we ask that you would bless Pastor Terry and the message that he has for us today that your words would speak to us and bring us closer to you and to depend on you in everything that we say and everything that we do. Lord, we pray all these things in your precious and holy name. Amen. Well, good morning. I think uh, this past week, it wasn't are we there yet, but is the snow done yet? I saw totals on our side of town between that 11 to 12 inch mark and went to start my car this morning and Diane goes, is your window open? And it was. I haven't driven since Tuesday morning. So I had a snow drift on my seat. You know what? God gave me a car with heated seats, so I'm all good. Dried it right off after I brushed it out. We got there. But as, as I think about uh, P Pastor Mark's message last week, getting a fresh start, and, and that road that he had that split off into what? Where we had to make a decision. Are we going to go with God or are we not? Is where is what I kept envisioning all week. And as we were talking after service last week, first thing I popped in my head, and this is all between the message and the graphic that Pastor Mark used, all I could think of was, are we there yet? And that's a, it's kind of a philosophical question, are we there yet? It's a question that gets asked a lot, especially when it comes to kids and traveling. Now, I, most of us, here, there's, uh, there's maybe one or two here that uh, still have small kids, and when you travel, I'm sure you hear, are we there yet? No, we're only about three miles further than the last time you asked. But that's like life. We ask, are we there yet? Uh, there was even a movie that came out, oh, 
17, 18 years ago called Are We There Yet? in which uh, there was a ladies man, his name was Nick, and he was trying to impress uh, the way they described it in the, the movie uh, description was a foxy divorcee. And he offers to take her kids on an extended road trip. This is a single guy, so he has no idea what he's in for or the torture he's about to endure. But as we go through life, we don't have to endure any kind of torture. I mean, think about it. How many of you, when you decided to go all in with your relationship with Jesus, couldn't wait to meet him? That night that I gave my life 100% to Christ, the night that I said I'm done playing around, I'm done being a pretender, I'm done being a casual Christian, as uh, Mark's message from a couple years ago uh, that we had, done being a CE Christian, uh, Christmas, Easter, I'm all in God. And in that moment, all I could think of was, so how soon do I get to see you, Jesus? Am I there yet? Now, we all want to get where we're going. And we all want to get there as quickly as possible. I know Pastor Mark has to leave this afternoon, short, right after service, and he has to drive out to North Platte, Nebraska. And we're going to be, going to be praying hard for safe travel and that he's able to stay awake the whole way and get there safely. But we want to get where we're going. And, and as I thought about that uh, this week, I, I really was reminded of the Israelites. And they're leaving Egypt for the promised land. Now, this whole story is told throughout the book of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And in it, Moses, along with his brother Aaron, they're sent by God to bring the Israelites out of Egypt. Listen to what it says in, in Exodus 3, it says, So I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. It is a land flowing with milk and honey, the land where the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites now live. And then a few chapters later in 7.5, it says, After giving Moses instructions on what he and Aaron were to do, God said, When I raise my powerful hand and bring out the Israelites, the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. Now Moses and Aaron would go on to see Pharaoh several times. And God would cause, uh, in some translations it says ten plagues, others it might say disasters. And they'd go before Pharaoh who finally will let the Israelites go. But only after God shows how mighty he is. But when they let them go, it, it didn't take Pharaoh very long and his officials very long to go, what in the world did we just do? That was our workforce. They were building our bricks. They were good workers. They worked hard even when we were horrible to them. They did whatever we asked. What have we done? So they changed their minds. They grabbed the chariots and, and the army and they headed after the Israelites. And they ultimately catch them up to them. And they have the Israelites pinned between the Red Sea and them. Now the Israelites had seen how great God was through those ten plagues, those ten disasters. But what happened when they got when push came to shove for them? They have they can't go one way because of the Red Sea. They can't go this way because of the army. So instead of getting on their knees, raising their hands to God, and lifting up in prayer what, where they were at, they pretty much just lost their trust in God. In Exodus 14, 10 and 12, it says, As Pharaoh approached, the people of Israel looked up and panicked when they saw the Egyptians overtaking them. <clears throat> now, they did cry out to the Lord. So it says, they cried out to the Lord and they said to Moses, why did you bring us out here to die in the wilderness? Weren't there enough graves for us in Egypt? What have you done to us? Why did you make us leave in Egypt? 
Didn't we tell you this would happen while we were still in Egypt? We said, leave us alone. Let us be slaves to the Egyptians. It's better to be a slave in Egypt than a corpse in the wilderness. They immediately went to the negative side of everything. And this would be a continuing theme for them throughout their journey in the wilderness to the point that that first generation would not see the promised land. I wonder how many times, because, and we read throughout the scriptures, you know, the different times that the Israelites complained to God and to Moses. But I wonder how many more times there actually were. Because it, can't, it couldn't have all been recorded. In our call to worship this morning uh, from Deuteronomy 8, verses 1 and 2, it begins uh, what my Bible is has a title as, A Call to Remember and to Obey. And the people weren't remembering. And they certainly were not obeying. Now, people now, more than ever, are being pulled in so many different directions when it comes to what to believe. I, I see, read and, and I listen to different pastors, and, and I listened to one pastor who said, he basically said that the things that God counts as sin are not sin. And he ultimately made Jesus out to be a sinner. And, and Mark and I have preached on this over and over and over again. These are the false teachers that the scriptures warn us about. And, and because technology has become so advanced, we have information available to us at our fingertips. In fact, when our technology doesn't work, it actually causes people anxiety. I can't get on and look at my Facebook. I can't see what's going on on Twitter. I can't see this. I can't see that. I don't know what's going on. And, and even people who claim that they have a biblical worldview. A biblical worldview is holding the scriptures to being the true word of God. Just as what it says in our statement of beliefs. There is no other authority other than the Bible. But these people are at risk. In fact, we are all at risk from this mass exchange of ideas. You can search for anything on the web. Anything at all. And you will come up with millions and millions and millions of different results. You will find things that, in fact, you will find what the Bible says. You will also find that it has been skewed in dozens of different ways, made out to be what people wanted to say to make themselves feel better. These false teachers, they've sprouted up, not just online, but in person. And we've talked about this many times. There are churches out there that are teaching false doctrine. They are not teaching what the Bible has to say. And people are being swayed by those teachings. This is why Jesus says, the road to hell is wide. But the road to heaven is narrow. That gate is a narrow gate. Because people get so swayed by what they hear and what they see and what they read. And, and those things that they're hearing, they sound reasonable. These people that are teaching this, this doctrine are teaching it in a way that sounds very convincing. And the problem is, is people say, hey, you know, well, I don't have time to look it up for myself. I don't have time to do my own research. So I'll just go whatever sounds best. And then people get into situations where they seem helpless and they grab on to whatever sounds the best to them. I was, Mark and I were talking last week and, and there's a, a, an article online uh, and, and several different outlets where it's been reported that one of the more famous uh, football quarterbacks in the NFL has renounced his faith 
because the pandemic has been too hard on you. This is scary. That someone can be swayed that easily. That means that whatever they're listening to, whatever they're reading and, and being taught, has got them in that, that uh, shallow dirt and their roots are not taking hold. And, and we just talked about how the Israelites were pinned and they had given up. And they immediately forgot all that God had done for them. They forgot, and this is the one that stuck out the most for me, they, they forgot that when they put the blood of the lamb on their doorposts, that the angel of death passed over them. They were spared, they were saved because of their faith. Yet they forgot this. They forgot how great God's power is. They forgot what God can do. And here's the, here's the thing. Regardless, God still shows up. And see, the other problem that we have is that we forget it is God. And when God shows up, our human tendency is to take credit for what God has done for us. Let's go back to Deuteronomy chapter 8 here. And in, it's in this chapter that, that Moses warns the people about taking credit for the things that God has done, for the blessings that God is going to give them. And like I mentioned before, it's, it is human tendency to take credit for things like that. So let's listen to start with verses 1 through 5 here. It says, be careful to obey all the commands I'm giving you today. Then you will live and multiply, and you will enter and occupy the land the Lord swore to give your ancestors. And remember how the Lord your God led you through the wilderness for these 40 years, humbling you and testing you to prove your character and to find out whether or not you would obey his commands. Yes, he humbled you by letting you go hungry and then feeding you with manna, a food previously unknown to you and your ancestors. He did it to teach you that people do not live by bread alone. Rather, we live by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. For all these 40 years, your clothes didn't wear out. And your feet didn't blister or swell. Think about it. Just as a parent disciplines a child, the Lord your God disciplines you for your own good. Now, too often, people want to get what they want. They want the good life. People think about the good life, and when they do, they think about money, they think about clothes, a big house, and that list just goes on and on. These are the things that can leave you feeling empty. They don't fill that hole that you have in your heart, and they leave you unfulfilled. Only God can fill that. Yet, in this part of the passage, we are also reminded that they didn't go hungry. Their clothes and sandals did not wear out. And their feet didn't blister or swell. Now this resonates with me pretty deeply. Especially after that year we just ended a few days ago. And the one that we've started now. Because really nothing has all too much changed. See, earlier this week, Diane and I had gone to bed and we had set our prayers and we're getting ready to go to sleep and God just opened her up and, and she pretty much said most people are seeing the worst year in their lives and then she went on to talk about some different things and, and those were yes a pandemic started and we had family and friends who were exposed in fact we even had some who were diagnosed with COVID-19. And of course, then we had the derecho hit and many of our family and our friends and our neighbors were affected. Many of us were without power for days and some for weeks. That meant no air conditioning. That meant no uh, microwave or stove or, or coffee pot. How many... And, 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 there's, there's many other things that went on throughout the year. 
Those are just the, the ones that popped in my head. And how many of those times did you or, or, or people that you know ask if the year was over yet? Are we there yet? Everybody wanted the year to be over. And all I could think in my mind when they would say that is, not much is going to happen you know, in that, that second from the click over from 2020 to 2021. But these are not the things that she started our conversation with, the bad things that happened. Here's what she did say. She gave, we gave thanks for the fact that our daughter Marissa and her husband Gabe, who each individually of one another were exposed to the coronavirus, but neither tested positive. Our daughter Carissa teaches fourth grade Yet they have not had any community spread in their school. And the one instance where she thought she may have been exposed, she wasn't. The kids' test, parents tested positive or negative, so there was no threat there. Our oldest daughter, she did get the virus. And she has stage 4 kidney disease. There was some worry there. Her case was mild. She got through it in her husband and daughter did not get sick. And then Diane's mom was diagnosed with COVID-19. The only thing that happened was she was more tired and it did cause some disorientation. Praise God. And then through this pandemic and through the derecho, we still have our jobs. Our neighborhood was one that had speeds that were clocked at 140 miles an hour during the derecho. Our pine tree in our backyard, we've been wanting to get rid of this thing for years because it was two thirds of the way dead. The storm took care of that. It came down on our deck. But here's the amazing part. The roots were so deep and this, there, there's a there's a message in this. The roots were so deep that it came down very slowly. And when it got to the railing, it just rested on there. It didn't even scratch it. Those deep roots are what we need as Christians to get through things like this, to have the type of conversation that Diane and I were having. In fact, we even had two panels of our, uh, our siding fall up, up towards the top of the roof. Now, we have been wanting to get new siding for years. In fact, we were getting ready to get bids to have it changed out to vinyl, get some new uh, insulation there and everything. If we had our new vinyl siding, it would have ripped it off, and I would not have been able to take those two panels, a hammer and some nails, and go up on a ladder and put them back in place and end up with no damage. We saw neighbors meeting neighbors and neighbors helping neighbors immediately as soon as the winds stopped. God then provided us with some amazing weather. We had our windows open pretty much the whole time and the house stayed cool. He brought us through it. God brought us through it just like he brought the Israelites through the desert. We had food, we had shelter, we still had our clothes, we still had our shoes. We were still able to do the things that we needed to do. And through it all, we still had our jobs. God showed up and he provided. Listen to what Moses says, starting in verse 6. It says, so obey the commands of the Lord your God by walking in his ways and fearing him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land of flowing streams and pools of water with fountains and springs that gush out in the valleys and hills. It is a land of wheat and barley, of grapevines, fig trees and pomegranates, of olive oil and honey. It is a land where food is plentiful and nothing is lacking. It is a land where iron is as common as stone and copper is as abundant in the hills. When you have eaten your fill, be sure to praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. As I was reading that, all I could think of is, if God is this good to us, then we should obey him. We should want to obey him. In fact, Charles Spurgeon says this, to live entirely for the Lord is to live indeed. All else, else is mere existing. 
We should walk in his ways and we should fear him. Now, this is not the type of fear that most people think of when we think of fear. Uh, more often than not, when we think of fear, we're fearing for our lives or we're fearing because of a bully or, or those type of things. But fear in the Lord is to have a sense of respect. It is to be in awe of what he has done and it is to then submit to his authority because of that. Fear of the Lord gives us direction in our lives and that direction fulfills us. Now I have to imagine that wandering through the desert for even a year had to be just as trying as this last year has been for us. But Moses is reminding us that what God has done for us is going to be so much better than what we're going through. He also reminds us that we need to be thankful and that we need to praise God for what he has done. See, our walk with Jesus can be like this. God humbles us and tests us to prove our character. Here's the question. Will we do our own thing or will we choose to obey him? When he humbled the Israelites by letting them go hungry, what happened? They wound. Well, oh, we have no food. Yet God still showed up. And he provided them manna and later quail. More than they could eat. You know, and he covered all their needs. Yet they still complained when there was plenty. We need to be thankful when God takes care of our needs. And even more thankful if he's taking, also taking care of our wants. It must serve as a reminder about God's love and goodness to us. It should inspire us to not only love, but to help those who don't have it as good as we do. It is because of these things that Moses warned the Israelites not to forget what God had done. We pick up in verse 11 where he says, but that is the time to be careful. Beware that in your plenty you do not forget the Lord your God and dis disobey his commandments, regulations, and decrees that I am giving you today. For when you have become full and prosperous and have built fine homes to live in, and when your flocks and herds have become very large and your silver and gold have multiplied along with everything else, be careful. Do not become proud at that time and forget the Lord your God who rescued you from slavery in the land of Egypt. Do not forget that he led you through the great and terrifying wilderness with its poisonous snakes and scorpions, where it was so hot and dry. He gave you water from the rock. He fed you with manna in the wilderness, a food unknown to your ancestors. He did this to humble you and test you for your own good. He did all this so you would never say to yourself, I have achieved this wealth with my own strength and energy. Remember the Lord your God. He is the one who gives you power to be successful. In order to fulfill the covenant, he confirmed to your ancestors with an oath. You see, we have to be careful in the good times to not get so busy and so self-involved with what God has given us, that we push him out, that we push him away. We used to have a radio station here in, in Cedar Rapids. Um, and I might always remember it as KWOF, K-W-O-F. And I always remember, it could have even been Pastor Mark who said it on air. A busy Christian is not necessarily a good Christian. We get busy and we forget what God is doing for us. The fact that, that God brought Diane to, to me that night and we had said our prayers and we were all said and done. And she opens up about all these wonderful things that had happened in the midst of a calamity. We truly were blessed. And we thank God for that. Too often, when we get all those things, 
pride enters in. I've always said, God, I, I don't need a whole lot. I just want enough that we are comfortable, that we have a roof over our head, clothes on our backs, and food in our bellies. And he has always provided. Moses ends this passage with these two verses, and he says, But I assure you of this. If you ever forget the Lord your God and follow other gods, worshiping and bowing down to them, you will certainly be destroyed. Just as the Lord has destroyed other nations in your path, you also will be destroyed if you refuse to obey the Lord your God. You see, when we forget who God is, when we forget what God has done for us, we act as the world would want us to act. We follow the ways of the world. Our worldview changes from what this book teaches to what the world tries to teach us. And then we are no better off than anyone else. In fact, taking the easy way through life, succumbing to the world, well, just as verse 20 says, it will destroy us. If we are not living the way that we are being taught in the Bible, the world will get its claws in us and it will bring us down. And quite literally, you cannot walk with God if you're holding hands with Satan. You can't. And we cannot lose our focus because if we are doing that, if we are trying to walk with God yet holding hands with the devil, we will lose our focus. And if we do that and we go after the things that we want, the things of this world, then we will miss out on what God has for us. Now, at the beginning of the message today, I asked this question. I said, how many of you, when you decided to go all in with your relationship with Jesus, couldn't wait to meet him? That question definitely has that, are we there yet, vibe to it. The thing is, is the farther... I get into my walk with Christ, the more I cannot wait to meet him. I want to meet Jesus. I'm ready for Jesus to return. But there's other things at play here. Because the further I get into my walk, the more I want to do while I am still here to serve God. Those two kind of are counter one another. Because I want to see Jesus, I want to be with Jesus, but I also want to serve God here. So this is how I will answer the question, are we there yet? I am there, but not yet. What I mean by that is, is I am right where God wants, to be, wants me to be right now. But I am still working on my relationship with Jesus. So yes, I am there. I, I can answer and say, I am there, but not yet. Father God, we thank you that on this walk that we have with you, that you guide us and direct us, that you give us a new perspective. We oftentimes will look back on the things that we've done and the places that we've been in our lives and we worry about how those will be viewed by you the thing is is that you take us where we're at in that moment when we turn our life over to you and in doing so father we ask that you fill us with the holy spirit so that those things we won't feel guilt for them. We will want to be far away from them. But that you, through the Holy Spirit, would change our hearts. You, through the Holy Spirit, would set us onto a new path. You, through the Holy Spirit, would get us to that Y intersection that Pastor Mark had on the screen last week. And you would have us choose the right path to walk with you so that we can get to where we're going, to get where you want us to be to live in eternity with you, Father. Father, when the question is posed, are we there yet? Yes, but not yet.
because you have us where you need us to be in this moment. You have us understanding the things that we need to understand at this time, but you continue to open our eyes, Father, and we thank you for that, that each and every time that we study your scriptures, that we listen to a strong biblical sermon, that you are teaching, and we are soaking that up and preparing to continue down that right path. Father, we thank you and we praise you in your son's precious and holy name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Terry. That was an awesome message. I think it's really one that we need to hear as we're going through the trials of our life. And it really focuses back to depending upon God and not on our own understanding, as the scriptures say, but really, truly, it's not just on our own understanding, but we tend to, tend to try and solve all the issues ourselves when God is the answer. And that's truly what we need to focus on today. We need to remember the promises that God gave to us. We need to remember the sacrifices that were made on our behalf by Jesus, by God sending his own son to fulfill the covenants that he had said early on and that he sent prophets to give us a message of hope, of a message of a new start, a new beginning in his son, Jesus. And then he sent his son to die for us. And as we come into this time of communion this morning, we need to remember those sacrifices, those promises that God made, but not only that he made the promises, that he made those covenants with the people, but that he fulfilled those promises. We need to look to those things and understand that God has been faithful to us even when we have not been faithful and so as we come into this time of communion this morning, let us remember those covenants, those promises that God made and fulfilled and continues to fulfill today. For on the night that he was given up, Jesus took bread and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Likewise in the meal, he took a cup and after he filled it and he blessed it, he said, this is the blood of the new covenant, my blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. And each time that you drink of this cup and eat of this bread, do it in remembrance of me. And so as we come into this time of communion today, we ask that you would do that exact thing and that is remember the sacrifices that were made for us. Remember the promises fulfilled by God to us and are still fulfilled to this day. The body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Thanks be to God. As we come into our times of communion each week, if you would like to participate along with us, for those of you who are online, uh, please just drop us a note, drop us a line, let us know, and we'll make sure that we get some communion cups out to you today. So let us go to God in prayer. God, we just pray today that our lives might be pleasing unto you in all that we do and all that we say. And in the words that you've given us, let us the words of my mouth and meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Lord, help us to understand and remember those sacrifices that were made for us. Let us remember those covenant promises that were made for us, Lord. And we lift ourselves up to you in, in obedience to your will that you would cleanse our hearts and make us new with you today. In Jesus' name.
we come to this time in our service where we have our prayers for the people and we've got a number of people that have been sent in to us. We've got a number of prayer requests that were sent in to us this week and uh, Steve and Denise are on the road and so therefore uh, she's not here to do the time that we normally do our agape time, our time of sharing and our, our time to really lift up those things. And as Pastor Terry was talking about in his message today, in the midst of the storm, in the midst of that derecho, we have a lot of things to be thankful for. See, God didn't just get us through the storm, but he blessed us during the storm. He gave us those blessings. He lifted us up out of the danger, and he brought us through the storm. Not that the storm would never happen, but in enduring those things that we did during the storm, God was there and proved out proved out the blessings that he had for us in the midst of the storm he brought us through so are there any other prayers or requests or praises that we'd like to lift up this morning if you do shout it out if not i'll go to the ones that we had online today okay but we do lift up steve and denise and their troubles and and their travels that they're they're doing we we pray for a hedge of protection around them for safe travels today we lift up those in the families that are having health issues and health concerns lord we just lift up those who are just struggling with life itself on a daily basis we lift them up to you as well lord because we know that your promises surround them and we are here as the body of christ to edify them to lift them up to build them up and to remind them of the covenant promises you made to each and every one of us. And remind us of those prayers, of the promises that you give to us, and that you fulfill on a daily blessing that you give to us each and every day. So Lord, we just go to you right now and we, we pray that we might understand your consciousness of your spirit surrounding us and letting us be conscious of you in all of your ways and all of your goodness and of all of your righteousness, Lord, that we might live in the continual presence and the consciousness and the presence of you, almighty God, and that we would be pleasing unto you in the things that we do. And Lord, help us to remember the blessings and that even in the midst of the storm, you're bringing us through the storm. Yes, we have to face that storm. But you are there bringing us through the storm. And for those who are suffering, for those who have health issues, Lord, for those who are living through losses, we lift them up to you, Lord, so you can surround them. Let them know of your love and your peace and your comfort today. And God, we just ask that you would be with us to bless us and keep you in our living grace through Jesus Christ. This just kind of popped in my head as Pastor Mark was praying. There's a, a artist out there, his name's Ryan Stevenson. He has a song in the eye of the storm. And that song was starting to play in my head as, as Mark was praying. And here's the thing, Ryan is, is that guy. He's that person who had a worldly life, who, who was addicted to drugs, who has, uh, and, and John Chris, who's a Christian comedian, had made fun of the tattoos that he had. Think, oh, we can't have our children going by him. He has taken everything, and he has turned his life over to God. And he has some amazing messages in his music. And the one in, in the eye of the storm, you remain in control. He's talking about God remaining in control. And here's the thing, and here's, here's what Proverbs 19, 21 says. It says, many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. Regardless of what we are going through, God will prevail. God will come through. God does show up, even 
when we forget to or don't want to. So pray with me as we close out our online portion of our service. Heavenly Father, as we start this new year full of ideas, full of expectations, we pray that we would listen to your will and that it would be first, your will be, be first in our lives, Father. Help us in the midst of everything that is going on around us to help us seek your wisdom and to be obedient to your commands. It is our prayer that our wants, our desires, and our dreams would all be part of your perfect plan. And I pray that in this new year that we develop an even deeper, more intimate relationship with you. I pray that as we become more like you, that people would see the hope that we have in you and that they would desire to know you. Whatever might be holding us back, Father, whatever holds us back from being with you, change it. Take away whatever is keeping us from a deeper relationship with you. And Father, we look forward to what you have for us in this new year with great expectation, knowing that you are capable of so much more than we realize. And Father, as we grow closer to you, let us be even more convicted to be your hands and feet. Thank you for all that you have done for us up to now and everything that you will do from this moment on. And all God's children said, Amen.